Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for our regular uh, seminar. So, series. Um, uh, hi. Looks like we have a couple of folks here with us now. Uh, maybe great if you come in, maybe on mute, um, because I think we're getting a little bit of feedback maybe from where you are. Uh, but again, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Leon McCray. I am the president of the Board of Trustees of the Family Medicine Education Consortium. I am the Senior Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Drexel University College of Medicine. Uh, and I'm really excited uh, to be with you today. Uh, we have started this wonderful uh, regular series where we get a sampling of really excellent content from our annual meeting. Um, and this uh, session today is gonna be about adolescent medicine and our update from 2022. Next slide, please. Uh, a little bit about our organization. So the Family Medicine Education Consortium, um, you know, I always say it's personal. It's really about um, the growth and promotion of family medicine um, and really making family medicine feel like it's home. Uh, it's a catalyst, a convener, an incubator. Uh, it works across 14 states and the District of Columbia and the Northeast portion of our country. Uh, it serves 60 plus uh, medical school departments and um, over 200 family medicine residency programs. We promote family medicine and primary care to our students. We support residents as they transition into their careers. We strengthen academic family medicine and its faculty. Uh, we create and sustain uh, quality improvement initiatives. Uh, and we really do work to stimulate innovate, uh, innovative approaches to primary care service delivery. So really it is our our goal and our mission is to improve the health of our nation by strengthening family medicine and primary care to meet its full potential. Um, now I mentioned what happened in 2022 in terms of our fabulous meeting that we just had, but we have another great meeting that's coming up in October of 2023. It's gonna be in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, October 13th to 15th. Uh, we are so excited to have you join us and looking forward to you uh, really engaging and, and learning about all the things that we do at the FMEC. And so with that, I'm going to get ready to introduce our esteemed colleagues today uh, who are going to be speaking. Uh, we have first Dr. Sam Sandowski and Dr. Danielle Firstler, who are both from uh, Mount Sinai, I'm sorry, the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, specifically the South Nassau Hospital. And they're going to spend time today uh, enlightening us about adolescent medicine. Thanks so much. Look forward to hearing the talk. Well, I want to say thank you all for uh, allowing us to uh, join you. And um, it's really a, a true pleasure to uh, be here today. I am going to uh, share my slides and um, hopefully uh, that will uh, work well. Um, if someone could just uh, confirm that uh, the slides are able to be seen. Looks great, Dr. Sandowski. Yeah, Fant confirm. Fantastic. So uh, once again, um, I want to say thank you. I'm Dr. Sam Sandowski, and I have with me over here uh, Dr. Danielle Firstler. And as was noted, we are from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai South Nassau. Um, we are part of uh, Family Medicine, and uh, we are going to speak with you about some updates in adolescent medicine today. Um, the bottom line is um, we really have nothing to disclose. Nobody is paying us to be here today. Um, I, when that happens, I can change my disclosure, but for right now, really, um, my only interest and Danielle's only interest is really to bring forth uh, some of the new items of what's happening with adolescent medicine. Um, so, you know, when we talk about adolescent medicine in general, um, you, you think about, oh, is this pediatrics, is this adult, is there somewhere in between? Um, and I take a look at uh, this slide and I think about adolescence and somebody once said, you know, it's almost like a different species, if you will, and it's very difficult to communicate with them. And one of the things that we're going to stress a little bit during our uh, talk here today is that we really do need to be able to speak the same language. Um, we might not always understand each other, meaning adolescents and different generations, um, but we need to try our best to do it because that's the only way we're going to be able to 
um, get through and communicate with them. Now, I am sure you've all heard about the HEADS approach to getting a good history um, as to what is happening with your adolescent patients. Um, and the HEADS acronym, if you will, um, talks about home, the e education, employment, exercise, activities, um, depression, diet, drugs. But we're also going to concentrate today a little bit more about the S's, the substance abuse, the sexuality, the suicide, and the safety, when we're talking about the history gathering and the impact um, that really has, I guess, society, the world, um, has had on adolescents and adolescents on society as well. So I'm going to hand off to uh, Danielle. Yeah, so when we begin these, uh, this part of the interview with adolescents, we often ask parents to step out and we have these conver conversations more independently and uh, confidentially. It's really important as this may be the first time for as a person, they're having these sort of conversations with physicians or providers, we need to make sure we understand and explain to them the role and what confidentiality is and when we need to, you know, reach out for help with others, such as suicide, um, and asking uh, if they understand um, and what questions they have so that they feel they are in an environment where they can express themselves um, before we really ask any of these sensitive questions, because this may be the first time they have this. And then we can, we can explain our role as a provider to educate and to counsel and to promote their health. Um, if we start specifically with sexuality, um, it's important to try to use non-judgmental, non-gendered language as much as you can. Um, you want to ask about, uh, are they attracted to boys, girls, both, maybe neither, maybe no one. Um, you want to ask about romantic relationships they may have been in. Um, asking about what types of experiences they have had, if, you know, it's holding hands versus kissing versus intercourse and what type of intercourse, um, asking specifically about consent, asking if they understand what consent is and um, if they've ever been touched in a way without their consent. Yeah, so, and you want to clarify terms that are unfamiliar to you. Um, you want to make sure that you have the same understanding of what they are, and this is very important in determining their risks, so you know what to screen for and how to counsel um, your patients. And always, of course, you want to keep an open forum and ask them what questions or concerns they have um, regarding sex, because they I, different places have different types of education, access to education, or they may not feel comfortable asking certain people, and you want to be uh, a resource for them so that they can be safe. Uh, things specifically you could ask adolescents who say they are sexually active. Um, you could ask what they're using to prevent pregnancy or from getting a sexually transmitted infection. You could ask them what they know about sexually transmitted infections, uh, as specifically like about HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, specific things. Um, you could ask them if they've ever had one and if they've ever been treated. Um, you could ask them uh, if they've ever been pregnant or if they've ever bothered a pregnancy. So there have been a few studies uh, to demonstrate now we're trying to reach out. How do we reach out to these adolescents to give them more information besides in our office? So there have been a couple of studies uh, recently in 2020, 2019 that uh, studied mobile health applications, like mobile uh, phone applications in disseminating uh, education and counseling about uh, sexual health for our adolescents. Um, and it really, a lot of them have been smaller studies and a lot of them have identified barriers, but that's a good start to try to promote more education and counseling out there. Um, specifically, uh, a lot of the data that we're using is from the U Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System or the YRBSS. Um, basically, it's a survey, a national survey that is school-based both in public and private schools. Uh, of adolescents in America um, that's conducted every two years by the CDC. It's really the point, the uh, objective of it is to identify risk factors for uh, acquiring HIV and other STIs. 
uh, but it really has a very large range of risks that they look at. Um, so clearly a lot of them are uh, sexual risk factors. Um, and it's very important because some of their data shows that in 2018, almost a quarter of new HIV diagnoses was between ages 13 and 24. About 10 million STI diagnoses were diagnosed between ages 15 and 24. And about 180,000 infants were born to adolescents in 2018. So it's important to make sure we know and they know. Uh, so this is some data specifically about high-risk sexual behaviors from uh, the YRBS and the um, through JAMA, because they have published an article on this as well. Um, not every year has had data, but things that are important to know um, are like how many uh, adolescents reported using a condom during their last sexual encounter, and that was a downtrend, which is the little stop sign. Uh, that's significant because that's a big role in uh, us knowing how we're educating our patients again. Uh, uh, the use of hormonal birth control has uh, gone up. That's the little, little green kind of shield sign. Um, again, that's good because it shows we're counseling our adolescents about uh, that and the risks of that. Uh, and then again, ever testing for HIV, that again is a downtrend. So again, that's a, us as providers educating our adolescents about this screening and like when it's worthwhile and doing the screening and thinking of it when we see them. So again, this just reiterates how there is not enough testing, not enough screening of our adolescents, and then in turn, not enough education of our adolescents to prevent these infections. Um, we also see trends, again, in terms of race, where uh, there are more likely to have, um, if you were white, you were more likely to have used hormonal contraception or have the hormone access to that or have been tested compared to those who are not white. Uh, if we move on now to another S uh, and a D, depression and suicide in um, our adolescents, we want to ask them specifically about their emotions. Uh, a lot of times adolescents will present with depression more somatic symptoms, uh, things like sleep issues, weight changes, difficulty concentrating, a lot of things beyond just feeling sad. A lot of times they'll be irritable or angry. Um, and specifically, you want to ask about uh, self-harm and suicidal ideation. You want to really ask details about the intent, uh, if they have a method, if they have access to that method still, uh, if they had ever attempted before and what happened if they had attempted. Uh, also asking if there's been a family history of suicide as that, is, uh, that does lead an increased risk of uh, suicide attempt in adolescents, as well as other risk factors like low self-esteem, bullying, uh, things of that nature. So then again, there's the USPS who's TF screening level, and we'll get into that later on in the presentation. Um, basically, there have been studies very recently uh, that looked at depression in adolescents during the pandemic, um, very recent years. Uh, it had been shown beforehand through the YRBSS data uh, pre-pandemic that rates had doubled, and then in just these three years, rates have doubled yet again um, in terms of the rate of depression, suicidal ideation, and suicide attempts in our adolescents. So this problem has only been exacerbated. Um, and again, this was a, a, another factor to consider amongst adolescents specifically is smartphones and social media. Um, while they have may, may have created some connectedness, there are also increased risk of bullying and um, other more negative self feelings. Um, they've created. So this was a, an a opinion piece from the New York Times that looked at a study, looked at, looked at uh, how teens and mood with different types of social media and smartphones. Um, basically, it showed that there is a correlation. Uh, so it's important, again, when you're assessing for depression and suicide, that you're asking about smartphone use. How often are you using it? What apps are you using? What are your privacy settings? Are you able to discern um, what's true, what's not true? Are you able to um, avoid cyberbullying or when that happens, how do you address that? Um, and again, this is just from the YRBSS specific data in terms of 
um, depression and suicide. And basically almost all of the trends are showing that more adolescents are experiencing this persistent sadness, more adolescents are considering suicide and more adolescents have made an attempt at suicide, um, which just shows how significant this issue is. Um, and then kind of hand in hand in that with safety, again, something I feel a lot of times gets overlooked with our adolescents, but this is the time when they start riding in cars, when they become more independent. So you wanna make sure that they establish good habits for their life. So making sure that in the car that they're wearing their seatbelt, make sure they're not under the influence of anything when they are driving, not getting in the car with, some, with a driver who has been under the influence of something. When they're riding their bicycles or certain sports, wearing protective gear such as helmets um, to protect themselves. Uh, a big thing also is weapons. Um, there are a lot of um, adolescents who live in homes where there are weapons, um, and it's very important to assess, do they ever carry a weapon? What are they carrying? Is there a gun in their home? How is the gun stored? Um, firearms should really only be stored, unloaded, locked, and separate from ammunition, and this is important to also counsel the parents to help uh, increase the safety in the home. So, uh, very, very big uh, uh, in news recently was the top causes of death in adolescents, uh, accidents, suicide, homicide, and then asking, of course, does race play a role? And yes, it does. Um, it has shown that homicide is the leading cause of death for non-Hispanic Blacks and African-American youth in our country. Um, and there's been a lot of data collected from the CDC and from the Children's Defense um, that shows that uh, gun violence now is the number one cause of death in adolescents and children. Um, and it surpassed motor vehicle accidents, which is very new because for very many, very, very many years, it had been motor vehicle accidents as the number one cause. And now gun violence um, is the number one cause. And unfortunately, black children have four times more likely than white children to um, succumb to this as well. Um, so it's very, very important that we are discussing this with our parents and with our adolescents. So if we talk about violence in general, um, again, the Wire VSS also looked at this um, and it shows that there are more and more students who are missing school secondary to safety concerns and um, many, many students, like one in five students, uh, report that they have experienced bullying. Many of them report they've experienced cyberbullying, um, and there have been uh, reports of adolescent, many reports of adolescents saying they've uh, experienced like dating violence or intimate partner violence. Now, if we go, this is brand new from last, is about a year ago now. Uh, uh, in terms of mortality of our adolescents and our children very significantly. Uh, it shows that now firearm related injury is the number one um, cause of mortality in adolescents and motor vehicle crashes is number two. Um, something also significant to note uh, during these years, very recent with the pandemic 2019, 2020, it shows uh, there's been a, quite the stark increase in mortality due to drug overdose and poisoning as well. So that's why it was important for us to bring up all of these topics. Um, and now we're gonna talk more about substance use and why it's very important to talk about that with our adolescents. Um, so, yeah, well, you know, we all, you know, rightly or not rightly so, think about adolescents and we think about um, use of substances. Uh, substances could be anything from any illicit uh, substance, marijuana, um, alcohol, cigarettes, or just uh, prescription uh, medications that are just being misused. And about five plus million young adults have reported substance abuse disorders. And the overwhelming majority, almost 90% have gone untreated. I mean, that's, you know, think about it. That's almost 90% untreated appropriately. And you take a look specifically at the 16 to 17 year old ages where about 
oh, somewhere between 10 to 15 percent are um, using marijuana regularly um, and alcohol somewhere between 15 to 20 percent. I mean, the nice and uh, cigarettes about five percent. The nice thing about alcohol and cigarettes is the use is actually down from about 20 years ago, um, which is great. Um, but some of the other illicit drug use is actually on the increase, and that's not so great. And we need to keep that in mind. So I have a question for you all out there. Um, and, you know, doing this virtually, it's a little difficult to get uh, some of the feedback. Um, but I want you to think about which is another name for heroin. Because remember, I talked about the fact that it's almost like another species and you have to speak their language. So you use the word heroin, that has a negative effect. But if you say, hey, you score some skag or horse or China white, which one is heroin? The answer is all of them actually are another name for heroin. And we should be aware of what they're talking about. Or for prescription narcotics, um, such as demis, octagons, footballs, stop signs because of the actual pill shape. Um, so we should be aware when you hear adolescents talking even among themselves, or if they say something to you that, oh yeah, you know, every now and then I'll you know take a stop sign. It's not about driving. So what is a Skittles party? Uh, and the Skittles party is something that I really have personally have trouble understanding um, as a physician when we sp prescribe specific medication for specific things. But really, what it is, everybody comes to the party and maybe you have oh, 20 people at the party and everybody brings two or three um, different medications that they find in the medicine cabinet. You know, it could be a Percocet, it could be an oxycodone, it could be a digoxin, you know, it could be a Tylenol. You don't know what you're getting, but you put that into a big bowl when you get there and everybody takes one, two, three, whatever it is that they decide. And, you know, that's a Skittles party. Pretty, pretty scary in a way. And what's even more scary is when you actually take a look at the Skittles packaging. Um, the Skittles packaging, it doesn't seem so scary. Those are Skittles. Um, but what's interesting is the one up here that says beware, those are just the regular Skittles. Maybe because and they beware because one or two of these Skittles in each packet are going to be very bitter tasting. But the Skittles down here are actually infused with cannabis. And these are actually cannabis Skittles. And by the packaging, unless you know to look for these specific leaves, you might think that, it, oh, yeah, this might be the you know one that might have cannabis because it says beware. But no, this is the one that you need to be aware of. So when, when we talk about substance abuse, there are really five stages. First, the person is curious. They think about it, then they may experiment and they keep on experimenting till they finally are using it regularly to the point where they actually become dependent on it. And finally, it's a point where they say this is their norm. So how do you sort of screen for this? Very often we know the CAGE um, acronym. Do you cut, are you cut down or are you annoyed about uh, people asking you about your drug or alcoholic use. And it's usually more with alcohol that we use this, but can go for either one. Um, do you feel guilty about using whatever it is that you're using? And um, eye opener, do you have to use your alcohol when you first get up in the morning? Do you have a drink when you first wake up? So that's the cage system. And if you have even one of those, then you really have to start exploring further. But in adolescence, they found that the craft questionnaire is much better. Um, and the craft uh, questionnaire is, have you ever ridden in a car by not just you or someone else who is either high on alcohol or drugs? Um, do you ever use your substance to relax or just feel better? Do you do it when you're alone? Or do you forget to do things when you are using whatever it is, alcohol or drugs? Does your family or friends get on your case to try cutting down on your use. And I think the most telling one is the last one is, have you ever gotten into trouble while using alcohol or drugs? You know, but the truth is, 
all these questions take an awful lot of time. Um, uh, and I um, do see uh, some questions in the chat, and um, I'm going to see if I can open those up. I hope I, um, uh, I just wanted to see that. Okay, no specific questions at this point. But the um, there, I understand and appreciate the fact that we are not often able to take the time. So I wanted to share with you what came out in 2019, a tool that while your patients are waiting in the waiting room, that they can actually complete this. And I wanna walk you through this real quick. And once again, I'm not a tech yet. I hope I don't get uh, out of the uh, presentation, but let's see if this works. Um, So basically, it takes less than two minutes. And basically, it's a screening tool for adolescent substance abuse. It's right on the internet. You can give them an iPad. You can have them do it on their phone if you want. Um, and um, there are two different options. So let's make believe we're doing this option. And we give this to one of the um, patients. You could do it as the clinician as well, or you could do it as the patient. And you hit this, and you say, OK, I'm the patient. I'm going to start. Um, by the way, um, I hope you're all seeing this, uh, um, but it, it says in the past year, how many times have you used tobacco? Let's say once a month. And then they say, how often have you used alcohol? Let's say once a month. And then you say, how often um, do you use marijuana? Monthly. And the next question is, how often are you using prescription drugs that were not prescribed to you? Once a month. And then they're asking about um cocaine or ecstasy or other illicit drugs once a month. And what ends up happening, uh, I, and then they ask about nitrous oxide, otherwise known as poppers. And that's actually another drug as well that needs to be asked about. And I use that once a month. Um, and then things like synthetic drugs, such as K2 or bath salts, um, which we have to do that. And you will get a thing that says your overall risk um, assessment and with that overall risk of it's higher, they will give you some suggestions of actions you can do and where you can go for brief interventions and and, and some target brief interventions um, that you can obtain. So this is a great tool um, and I hope you're all able to see that. Um, yes. So the next uh, question that really comes up is drug screening. I cannot tell you how many times I've had a mom come to me and say, I'm really concerned about Janet. I think she's doing drugs. Can you screen her? The answer is I could screen her. I could get a urine. I could get a blood. Or usually it would be a urine tox. But I would not do that without the patient's consent. Um, and the American Academy of Pediatrics does not insort, uh, uh, endorse such non-informed screening. And I let the parent know, can it be done? Yes, but I only do it with their knowledge. It puts a very, very bad, um, it makes causes for a very bad scenario um, when you are doing something behind your patient's back, even with the parent's approval, uh, because you have just lost all credibility with that patient. But if you are going to screen, make sure you get the appropriate sample, like I said, urine or serum, um, and sometimes they even use hair. But the, the question is, how long does it actually stay in the system? Because, oh, well, you know what? I did it last night. I did it a week ago. You know, will it be there? Will it not be there? So how long does a drug screen remain positive? Usually in the urine, amphetamines, less than 48 hours. Barbiturates, about three to four days. Same thing with Coke. Alcohol, usually within, you know, 12 to 14 hours. That's going to really not be present. Opiates, about two days. But cannabis is going to be present for about, oh, you know, three weeks, even possibly a month, or even maybe even longer, um, especially in the hair. But realize that that screening 
can remain for a real while. Um, the um, I just wanted you to just be aware there is something called DASH, which is the Division of Adolescent and School Health. And these are just some of their goals, just so that we can all be on the same page that they want to decrease the prevalence of risky behaviors um, that contribute to HIV, STD, um, unwanted pregnancies. Um, they want to advance health equity and they want to increase implementation of strategies that will promote factors that contribute to healthy development. So I bring this out because if you have the right mission and the right goal in the right direction, it really is great for planning of how to address your patients. Now I'm going to put on a different hat right now in a different direction because it's not only about caring for the adolescent with high risk behaviors, but what about, you know, Johnny? Johnny is 15 years old and he's going to summer camp and he needs his vaccinations and he wants to make sure they're up to date. How do you know if John is up to date? So let's go through some of the recommendations. So generally speaking, at the age of 11 or so, you start to give them a booster, a Tdap, which is recommended. And if they haven't had it, you know, during 11 or 12, when it's usually recommended, make sure you give it to them when they're a little older in their adolescence. Um, for HPV, one of the, um, it's rec it is absolutely recommended. It used to be the uh, quadrivalent, now it's a nine valent that is preferred. And what's nice is if you can give it to the adolescent at the age of two, you can say, you know what, you're only getting two shots. You don't need to have three shots. You're young and you're getting this early. So encourage them at the age of 11 or 12. If they're already over the um, age uh, of 14, meaning when they're 15 and up, at that point, you're going to have to give them three vaccines. One now, one in two months, and then one in six months. Um, so the earlier they do it, the more likely they will be to save a vaccine. How about for meningococcal vaccine? Um, they are recommending that they're um, at the um, in age of 11 and a booster at the age of 16. Now, just to let you know, if they haven't gotten it till the age of 16, then they get it at the age of 16. Um, they don't need a booster after that. So it's a one shot after the age of 16, um, but don't tell them about that part. Just give it to them early and then at 16, give them the second one. Um, Immunized early is my approach. Um, influenza is recommended year yearly. For pneumococcal, uh, only high risk individuals, and also for hepatitis A, um, they should be, um, now we're vaccinating everyone, kids and all. Um, over the age of 18, it's one cc, less than 18, it's a half a cc. Hepatitis B, uh, generally speaking, we give those three doses. Um, if you're doing a Recombivax, then you can give two. Um, and you know, for uh, polio and MMR, um, we want to make sure that they have received their primary. And there's really no recommendations um, at this point. Um, it's 13 to 18. Um, varicella, when people go into the healthcare industry, you know that we often check with, um, we, uh, for varicella, and if they wane, if they've been immunized and they wane, they might need to get boosted again. Um, let's talk about COVID. They are recommending COVID vaccines for children um, as young as six months of age, and they are recommending that they get the two primary uh, vaccines, the two vaccines as a primary, and then a booster. The there are um, several companies out there. It's the uh, Pfizer, Biotech, and Moderna that are able to give you the primary plus the booster. The Novavax is okay to give adolescents uh, adolescent, uh, over the age of 12, but not for a booster. And J&J &J should not be used in kids. You know, when we first gave this talk back in um, as, as a back in uh, 2022, when I put this slide up there, it said monkeypox vaccine. Monkeypox has now been renamed Mpox, and uh, Genios is the only approved vaccine. What's really interesting is that the way they gave the monkeypox vaccine 
for adults is initially they gave it intradermal. There was not enough to go around. So they decided to change this. So I'm sorry, they gave it uh, sub Q right? uh, and there was not enough sub Q because you had to give um, um, 5 C, um, uh, uh, 0.5 cc's and then they changed it to intradermal and uh, in, intradermal where it is now 0.1 cc. So therefore the same amount of serum could go five times as far. But it was not recommended for adolescents. For adolescents, you should still be giving sub Q. The intradermal is not approved for adolescents. Now, that being said, um, you know, it, the MPOX vaccine was recommended for, for uh, post exposure uh, prophylaxis in adolescents. But what about for pre exposure prophylaxis? What if um, you have a 17 year old high risk individual? High risk individuals are um, generally men who have sex with men. And if you have a 17 year old, but is engaging in a high risk uh, behavior, you know, theoretically, they're not quote approved, but at the same time, they do need to be protected. And we need to keep that in mind. I'm bringing this up now because monkeypox a year ago at this point was really just starting its surge in, in June and July of, uh, this, actually May, June, July of last year, um, there were, thousands of people that were getting infected. Last week, an advisory came out and they are surveilling monkeypox because uh, this, over the last two weeks in Chicago, um, eight cases have been identified um, and we are strongly concerned about a resurgence of monkeypox coming now. So, Please be aware, um, just to let you know, I was looking into this resurgence um, of those people. Interestingly, the overwhelming majority of those infected actually had had uh, had been vaccinated, um, but none of them had required hospitalizations. Um, so we're hoping that the MPOX vaccine has um, made the disease a little bit less um, severe. Some of the things that have been, uh, at least in New York City, and I don't know where you all are at, but probably goes city to city um, and probably very similar. These are the requirements in order to go into grade six through 12. You need to have two doses of MR, your uh, um, DTAP, three doses. Uh, but now they've also recommended and required, rather, a TDAP booster. Um, so you. And what did red is now required. You know, polio and hep B and varicella were always required, uh, but now meningeal cockle is required as well. And those are the things in red. Those are the new addition of requirements. Um, what's interesting, those vaccines in blue, the pneumococcal, hemophilus, and your annual influenza vaccine, strongly recommended, but not required for school. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about what I call the U.S. recommendations. If you couldn't understand me, it was not an internet connection. That's the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. And if you try to say that all at once, it comes out like that. But the recommendations are really graded with it. A, B, C, D, or I recommendations. So when I take a look at those recommendations, just so you all have an idea very uh, quickly, A is absolutely do it. B is you're better off doing it. C is consider doing it. D is don't do it. And I is I don't know or indeterminate. Um, so when you see those recommendations, A is absolutely and B is you're better off doing it. D is don't. C is consider it. And I is inconclusive. I don't know. Indeterminate. So if you want to post on the chat, absolutely great. If you um, want to just think to yourself, lipid disorder screening. This is for the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. What do you think the recommendations are for an adolescent? Yes, I'm sorry. There... I'm sorry. Did somebody have a question they were asking? I'm sorry. Are you using this? No. no. Okay. So, you put the weights on and I... so the, um, so the really, um, 
interestingly, there are different academies, but the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force for children and adolescents under the age of 20, it's an I recommendation. It's indeterminate. Very often you'll have like a, a, um, other organizations, they may say to check um, children that are young, uh, below let's say the age of 10, or maybe after the age of 16, but not let's say between 13 and 16, because the hormones may um, change those uh, lipid values. Um, but your defensive services task force says, no, it is not recommended, indeter uh, but it's not not recommended, it's an indeterminate. How about for syphilis? What level of recommendation is for syphilis? And the answer to that is A. Basically, um, re they recommend a syphilis infections who are at risk for infection. Um, so anybody who is sexually active, um, and this is not just for pregnant women. Um, there was a draft recommendation um, in 2022, looking at the 2016 recommendations, and they are really very similar. An A recommendation. What about for herpes? Are they recommending screening for herpes? And the answer to that is no. That is a D recommendation. And um, they came out with a draft in August 2022 that says it is still a draft. So the first number is what's currently out there, and this is the most recent um, draft. So herpes should not be screened. What about chlamydia? Well, for chlamydia, that's, a, you know, some people may say, yes, do it. Some people say, no, nah, that's going to be indeterminate. Uh, well, it's going to depend on two things. One is um, the uh, sex and the other is the age. So let's say women, women who are sexually active at age uh, 25 and older, that's really an I recommendation for those who are under the age of 24, uh, 24 or tw 25, under the age of 25, 24 and younger, um, those women who are sexually active should be screened. What about men? So the CDC, uh, sorry, um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is going to say it's an I recommendation. Um, so if you're taking your research or your boards, then you need to know that it's an I recommendation. Um, from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. However, the CDC says if you're a man who's having sex with men, um, then you need to screen and screen regularly. Um, so that's the difference. Um, what about depression? Now, I know that Dr. Fersler was speaking about screening for depression and also talking about suicide. And these also are really interesting uh, um, recommendations that we might not have thought. So for depression, they are recommending screening for depression. And there is a PHQ-9 specifically for teens. But what comes out new this year or this or last year, um, just about a year ago, is that they also are recommending screening for anxiety. So not just screen for depression, but also screen for anxiety. So if we screen for depression, is there anything we could do about it? What do we do? And the recommendation is, generally speaking, we like to use an SSRI for depression in adolescent, but the one that's been shown to be the most effective is fluoxetine. It's the only one that had a confidence in interval that uh, didn't cross the one. So Danielle, like I said, spoke about screening for depression and suicide. So while they are recommending screening for anxiety and depression, they are indeterminate about the recommendation for suicide. So if you do it, I applaud you and I would recommend it, but your preventive services task force are saying it's insufficient evidence. What about alcohol screening? Should we screen our alcohol I, I, well, should we screen for alcohol in adolescence? I don't know anybody here who's going to say, no, we shouldn't. So we're all going to presume that it's going to be an A or a B. But the reality is, it is an I recommendation for adolescents. They are, the U.S. Professor Services Task Force is recommending alcohol screening for people 18 and above. A lot of other societies don't necessarily agree with that. 
How about screening for drug use or for tobacco? And you would think, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's interesting. They are giving it an I recommendation for drug use screening. And, you know, if somebody is found, is known to be a smoker, they are, rec um, they are recommending that if they are a smoker, it's an I recommendation as whether or not you, you talk about cessation of smokers. But if they're not a smoker, they are giving a B recommendation to prevent you from becoming a smoker. So the intervention that they are really recommend, uh, recommending is if they're not smoking, counsel them of why they're doing such a great job of not smoking. If they are smoking already, it's indeterminate as to whether or not your counseling is helpful. I still recommend it by all means, but your defensive services task force and should you be taking your boards? No, it's an I recommendation. So what are they also recommending? They recommend that our adolescents get eight to 10 hours of sleep per night and that they exercise one hour a day and no more of than two hours of screen time. Screen time does not necessarily mean homework or doing what we're doing in terms of education, but just playing video games and or watching TV. Um, they recommend 60 minutes of moderate, vigorous uh, physical activities and um, three days a week of aerobics, as opposed to the adults um, who are being recommended, two days a week of weights and 150 minutes a week of uh, moderate aerobic activities. How about screening for eating disorders? And usually the screening disorders, um, we're, we're talking about um, usually uh, anorexia in particular. Um, and that is an eye recommendation as well. They're thinking that they could probably use a stronger statement, but until they have more data and more evidence, they have not provided a stronger recommendation. What about screening for diabetes and prediabetes? And once again, that too is an eye recommendation because there's not enough research. The task force recognizes that there are certain groups such as American Indians, Alas um, Alaska Natives, Blacks, Hispanics, and Latinos, as well as children with obesity that are at increased risk, but they have not separated out their recommendations yet. They are saying they advocate for you know, increased physical activity and healthy diets. So once again, um, um, for high-risk individuals for um, hepatitis B, Everybody at the age of 15 should be screened for HIV and then subsequently based on risk factors, um, recommending PrEP for people who are at risk for HIV and screening for syphilis um, are all A recommendations. Um, so B recommendations include gonorrhea and chlamydia for uh, women on, um, who are 24 and younger, um, and I for men, tap smears, Absolutely do those after the age of 21, but not need it. Shouldn't do, have to do that before to, um, 21 and don't screen for herpes. Um, you should counsel those who are ri at risk for STIs and you should counsel those about uh, those who are studying themselves and are trying to tan themselves about skin cancer. That is a B recommendation. It used to be an indeterminate, but they've actually shown that counseling does help. Uh, for depression, like we said, it's a B recommendation. Um, and for screening for obesity is a, is a B recommendation. But for uh, checking for testicular cancer is a D. And you can see the other ones here for illicit drug use is going to be an I, like we mentioned, uh, as, as well. Um, as well as suicide, checking for blood pressure and lipid disorders as well. Scoliosis changed from a D to an I as well. And what's interesting is for motor vehicle restraints using seatbelts, counseling, they said that their recommendations not going to have an impact. So they stopped even mentioning that. So here we are talking about some of the recommendations for screening. Um, and screening, like I said, is going for the average adolescent. But um, 
Dr. Furser is now going to talk a little bit about some high-risk groups as well, and particularly the LGBTQ community. Yeah, just very briefly, we just wanted to mention, since this is becoming more and more prevalent, as I was talk about, um, is addressing our LGBT adolescents um, and things to consider uh, in terms of their screening and counseling um, and things that make them more high risk uh, or at high risk for uh, more significant issues. Um, based, this is um, from 2016, and so I'm sure it's only even more prevalent now that around 300,000 students uh, reported identifying as gay or lesbian, around 900,000 identi reported identifying as bisexual, and about 500,000 uh, reported uh, being unsure of their sexual identity. Um, something also interesting of note was they looked specifically at data of their actual activity as opposed to their identification, and there was some discordance there. Um, I think really just the take home from that is to, one, make sure that things are happening uh, consensually um, and that it's not violence, um, but also understanding that this is a time of change and development for adolescents. And the most important thing we can do as providers is provide a safe, non-judgmental space um, for them to report things so that we know um, when it's a safety issue, when it's a health issue, um, and just to monitor our patients. Um, if we talk specifically about bullying uh, in uh, adolescents who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, it, uh, data has shown that it is more common in those who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual as opposed to straight. Um, they're more likely to experience bullying, electronic bullying, forced intercourse, and dating violence. Um, in terms of drug use, similarly, data has shown that uh, adolescents who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual or have higher rates of reporting drug use as opposed to their straight counterparts. And something interesting is the specific substances that are uh, elevated, such as hallucinogens, methamphetamines, um, heroin, these are things that we don't always ask about, but we should in these populations. Um, in terms of mental health, um, again, uh, adolescents who reported uh, identifying as lesbian, gay, or bisexual had higher rates of feeling sad or hopeless, considering suicide seriously, making a suicide plan, and attempting suicide compared to their uh, straight counterparts. And it's very important uh, that we are non judgmental because these factors, like the way um, a lot of these adolescents feel, um, is significant and it is causing a lot of harm. Um, if we talk about uh, transgender youth, um, this is back from 2019, so again, a little bit older, and I'm sure it's only more prevalent now. Um, about 1.8% of adolescents had identified uh, as transgender, and about a, the same percentage about reported that they weren't sure. And again, just like with those with the sort of sexual minority, uh, those who identify as transgender were more likely than their cisgender counterparts to report being bullied, report feeling sad, report attempting suicide, report dating violence. Um, then to talk about again, Dr. Sandowski had touched upon it as well, that what's important about identifying our adolescents who, what their sexual identity is and um, their gender orientation uh, is because there are some recommendations from the CDC, USPSTF, and other um, agencies uh, based on these activities, what makes them a little bit more high risk and when we should be testing them um, for specific STIs um, based on specifically what their uh, infections are. And then again, uh, there's also uh, vaccines that are um, recommended as well based on um, sexual orientation and activity uh, that, again, uh, men who have sex with men, this is just an example of one population that we can uh, look for specific data for to make sure that they are being properly protected. Uh, lastly, when we talk about uh, more protecting of our adolescents um, in terms of PrEP, uh, there have been some studies that uh, showed 
that PrEP is safe and efficacious in our adolescents. Um, the biggest issue was adherence. Um, so I think, again, it's on us as providers to make sure we are properly counseling and advocating for our adolescents who are at risk um, and reminding them like why this is important and providing this for them as appropriate. So I really want to say thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I know we uh, may have about one or two minutes uh, for any uh, questions. Um, and I don't know if uh, anybody has any questions at this point, um, but uh, we're a uh, small enough group. So please, if you do, um, please ask. Um, and if you don't, I just want to say thanks for the opportunity for having us here. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I will come off of video. For some reason, my video is not letting me uh, come off so I can see you both. I don't know. Maybe my maybe my computer somehow disabled the video, but it won't let me hop on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Cool. Um, so first, uh, thank you so much for such a vigorous uh, conversation, a, such a comprehensive one. Um, I really appreciated the fact that you incorporated uh, so many groups. You talked about the bullying, talked about you know, kind of what I call like the sex, drugs, and rock and roll of uh, uh, of adolescent health. Uh, it's really, really important. Um, it was really nice to to give it that framework. Um, one of the things that that we do in our space is, um, and I, and then maybe I missed it. Do, do um, you know, you talk a lot about um, you know, folks in the queer community. Um, was it? you know, ha have you had significant experience with folks who are trans and how you're dealing with that in terms of, you know, uh, adolescents who are transitioning and, uh, and has, that, has that stuff come up in your, in your space? So we actually have a really very small uh, trans uh, patient cohort over here. Um, okay. We do have a couple. Um, and uh, I mean, as part of the Mount Sinai health system, um, we're very, very fortunate that we have a great uh, se um, center for a gender affirming care um, awesome. the, over in the, the city so that it's easy for them to access. Um, so it's a double edged sword that we don't may not get as many in our office, but we have no, no. a great like resource that we do recommend that. Um, Right. As well. Uh, I feel like, you know, transgender individuals, um, folks in, in across the, the gender identity spectrum have a, a real importance. And especially in adolescence, as we try to figure out what it what used to be the definition of normal and abnormal. And now we have just a full spectrum of what is normal. Um, those are really important things to consider. So uh, again, I really, really appreciate it. I know we are right at the 130 hour. I don't necessarily see anything that's coming uh in the chat. Um so with that, I'm going to thank you both so, so much for the time, uh, for really educating us as a community today. And I look forward to, to seeing everyone again soon. Take care. Thank you thank all. You. Thank you. Take care all. Bye-bye.